Okay. Good evening, Good evening everyone. Uh, please take a seat. Uh, make sure your cell phones are off and uh, so we can get started with this evening's program. It's my pleasure to introduce Dean Yves Gano, uh, Dean of Physical Sciences and Engineering, who's going to introduce tonight's speaker. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening. What should I say? Upon leaving Ecole Polytechnique some 18 months ago, I was, of course, presented gift, number of gifts. But there is one that is more dear to me. This is actually a book written in French. Uh, the translation would be nine billion human being to feed. And the, this book was written and uh, autographed to me by our today's plenary lecturer, Dr. Marion Guillou. So after reading this book, which I did after joining Kaus, because she, I mean, uh, autographed that book almost the very day I left Ecole Polytechnique, after reading that book, I said to myself, why don't we invite her to Kaust to share with us the content of this book? And uh, the idea was proposed to the web committee, and I'm glad that Marion accepted our invitation to talk about uh, the content of this book. So I would like to take this opportunity to uh, introduce a bit who is our today plenary uh, lecturer. So Marion Guillou, Dr. Marion Guillou, is a typical product of the French, I would, I would say, meritocratic system, in the sense that she is an alumnus of the merited and prestigious Ecole Polytechnique, where she was one of the very first uh, female student to graduate before the 70s, but not, that school was not even open to female students. And in 73, she was admitted to, to that school. And then uh, she also carried on with a PhD on food science. So we have actually somebody who has a very strong background in science and engineering, specialized in the domain of, of food science. She then entered a career of, of a civil servant for the French government. You know, the kind of uh, corps of civil servants, high level civil servants, with a very strong background in science and engineering, who have been running for the 200 years, the high administration in France, not only running the high administration in France, but also advising the government on scientific and uh, technological major issues, such as food, agriculture, in the case of, of Marion, but also, I mean, space, but also telecommunications. I mean, this is the way the country of France has been run for almost, I mean, 200 years. So when I was at Ecole Polytechnique, actually, Marion Guillou was my boss for four years as the chair of the Board of Trustees of Ecole. And at the same time, she was the president and CEO of the French, how do you say that? French National Institute of Agricultural Research. I'm trying to translate that in English. And this is an organization of, of about 8,000 people, not all scientists, of course, but 8,000 staff members, and running a budget below 1 billion euros and she did that for about uh, eight years. Hmm? So previously she was working directly in the Ministry of Agriculture as director uh, of food uh, safety. At a time that was very difficult time in Europe because that was the time I don't, um, uh, among you certainly some re uh, remember the days of the mad cow disease when she was in charge of food security at a very tough time. 
and she was in, in charge of that. And I think that she's also responsible to helping the government at that time to putting up a law on food security. And previously, she was a scientist working on technique to, mod to monitor food security, the biotransformation during food processes, and so on and so forth. So you understand that Marion Guillou has more than one facet. You have a very strong facet nowadays, that of an executive dimension. And this executive dimension in her career is seated on a very strong scholar academic dimension because of her achievement. So on the executive side, I, it would be too long a list to cite all the, I mean, membership of Marion Guillou nowadays. I just want to mention that she's a board member of big companies like the bank company BNP Paribas, Veolia, a very important company for water and environment, but she's also a uh, I mean, board member of a small company, a chemical company, whose name is Imeris. As I said, she has more than one facet. This is the executive facet. She's also an advisor, advisor to the government. Recently, she wrote a very well-noted report for the French government for the, ten year, for the next 10 years, how to reconcile sustainability ecology, and food production. It's kind of <coughs> policy to develop in the next 10 years to achieve sustainability and, and food production at high level. She's sitting also on other, uh, other uh, board as a member. For instance, she's a member of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations as an advisor. On the academic side, she's a member of the French Academy of Technology, the French Academy of uh, Agriculture. And nowadays, she stepped down from INRA, this uh, French Institute for Agricultural Research, that she has really transformed uh, into a more holistic organization, tackling problems in a more interdisciplinary way. Uh, problems of food, agriculture, and environment. And now she's a president of a consortium, a public consortium, whose name is Agrinium. And this is a consortium of scientific agencies working in the area of agriculture and environment. And of course, the consortium is trying to foster research with the idea of to, as I said, reconcile food production and sustainability. So by ending this very short presentation, I would like to warmly thank Marion for accepting our invitation to come to KAUST. And also I would like to say how proud I am that she accepted our invitation. So Marion, the floor is yours. So I don't know why they add, you know, something in wood so that I'm not too small. So I'm very happy to be there tonight. And I have to tell you I've been quite impressed by the visit uh, I made today in a few labs and in your university. So I will try to talk about feeding 9 billion people, there is a mistake, in a sustainable way as a world challenge. And I know I'm talking between very prestigious and very good uh, people. Yesterday you had a presentation by Nina Fedorov and presentations about GM. And tomorrow you will have presentation, or tomorrow or yes, soon, a presentation about biofuels. And so I tried to concentrate my speech on questions that you did not hear about already. In fact, I will concentrate on uh, food security today, the constraints on the environment, the solutions for tomorrow, the importance of climate change impacts, and of course, solutions, if we may uh, finish by that, that is to say how science can help and how decisions can help 
the context for 2050. I'm sorry, I should apologize directly because I have quite a, a strong French accent, but I hope you can understand me. And uh, if you don't, just tell it. So all what I will present, you will find in the book uh, that has been translated in English that Eve just quoted. So in fact, why did we write this book? Not because we had free time, because we were quite busy, but because we thought it was very important to look at this question of sustainable food systems on a holistic way. That's what Eve just quoted. I mean, it's impossible now to talk about agricultural production without talking about climate change or energy, without talking about uh, workers, without talking about urbanization, without talking about soils. And then you see that there is you know, a link between all those questions. So it makes it important to look at all the facets together. And in France, when I read newspapers, I was always angry to see that the media just looked at you know, a small, tiny bit of the problem and never looked you know, at the consequences of uh, the system. And so that's why after you, know, you become angry once, twice, and then you say, well, what should I do? And then you try to write what you think about the system. So the food security today is quite paradoxical because, of course, we are many people now on the planet, but there, there is no real global problem of food availability. Of course, there is a problem of food availability in some places and for some people. And maybe some of you are economists and read Amatya Sen, the Nobel Prize, that said that if you know, there is famine, it's not that there is not enough to feed the people, it is that some people don't have enough to eat. So why? Because there could be physical problem of access when you have a war or crisis, there is often an economic problem of access because of poverty or prices. And of course, there are questions of um, inequalities, if I may say so. So I will talk about the world situation. And when you talk about the world, it's important to look at different zones of the world. So I will give you the meaning of uh, uh, the letters you will see on some of the slides. Of course, here we are in Middle East and Northern Africa. Uh, you have a global group that is called OECD countries. It's North America, Europe, and Australia. A former Soviet Union is the orange one. Asia is the um, purple one. And then you have Latin America, Central and Latin America, and Sub-Saharan Africa. And so when we look at the evolution of the past years, you know that the population dramatically increased be between, for instance, 1960 and, uh, and 2000, from 3 billion to 6 billion. I mean, in the history of humanity, you realize what change it makes. It never happened at that scale, of course. And it's still going on. And when you look at agricultural productivity, that is the supply side of the food system, and you, here we talk uh, in abscess in kilocalories per hectare per day, uh, because I will tell you, tell you what is necessary to feed one person, then you see that the evolution is positive almost everywhere, except in, for, in former Soviet Union, because, of course, of the political problems. But in other places of, of the world, the yields increased, of course, at very different rates. On average, in the world, in fact, the plant yields have doubled uh, from 8,600 to 19,200 kilocalories per hectare per day. So when you look at the way it was possible Maybe some of you remember Malthus' prediction. And I have seen that Nina quoted that. Of course, he said that uh, there were less than one billion people at the time. And he said that it, he wrote that it was impossible to increase the population to feed it. But 
Of course, history showed it was not true. And because of what we call globally the green revolution, that is to say genetics, breeding, fertilizers, mechanization, pesticides, uh, irrigation, and globally what we call intensification. So while the population doubled, the yields did more than double. So we, are, we have more now than we had uh, 50 years ago. But there are more inequalities in production than there were 15 years ago, 50 years ago. Uh, of course, when uh, you looked at the graph before, yields have doubled in MENA, in uh, Middle East and North Africa, and in South Saharan Africa. They have remained stable in the uh, former Soviet Union, but they have increased a lot in OECD countries in Asia. Even if in the recent years, and we will talk about that afterwards, there has been a slowdown. So what is the situation today? So the production has increased a lot, more than the population, but still we have undernutrition. In proportion, it decreased a lot. But in absolute numbers, you see this, uh, well, very sad evolution. That is to say, a first period where it decreased on a regular basis, and then the crisis, what, what we called the price food crisis of 2008, and the fact that it increased and then decreased again. So in fact, undernutrition is still quite a lot. Anyway, it's always too much. And at the same time, overnutrition is increasing, and at the moment, it's about the same number of people that are undernourished and the number of people that are overnourished. And it's, uh, you know, a graph from the WHO, the World Health Organization that I show there. That is to say, when you look in abscess at the time and uh, you look at the risk size, in fact, the classical risk, if I may call them like that, under nutrition, water, sanitation, and hygiene problems are decreasing very steeply. But at the same time, new risk and overweight is one of those new risks are increasing quite quickly at the same time. And when you look at the situation, well, zones by zones, if you want, it's, well, everywhere it increases, it increases quite quickly, but with very big cultural differences. The evolution is different for women and for men when you look at women, in fact, the worst situation are in Southern Africa, in North Africa and Middle East and Central Latin America. And for the men, it's not the same situation. The worst situation is North America, then Southern Latin America, then Australia. Asia. So you see that everywhere obesity is increasing, but in a different way. And in fact, what protects uh, some population, is cultural diet habits. So why is it so important? I mean, the race in um, uh, this obesity rate. If I make it short, I know that yesterday you had a conference about evolution. You know, usually uh, there is a genetic adaptation of the populations to the environment. But the change in diet was so quick that some genetic population, let's quote the Han in China or other populations, that have been selected to be very efficient to transform the food intake. Of course, the people that survived were the more efficient ones. And then suddenly they have an excess in calories, an excess in sugar, an excess in fat usually. And then the reaction is very quick. So the change we had in some countries through the centuries, the, the other countries have within 10 or 20 years. And that explains the very dramatic change in the obesity rate and the real problem of health it goes to the world population. So talking about these nutritional transitions, you know, when you look at the history of the world, you see that the history is always the same. First, when people become richer, if you want, 
the first reaction is to eat enough. It's quite sensible. Then the second reaction is to di diversify the food diet, you know, to decrease the classical ones and to diversify. And the third evolution, and it has been general, even in countries where you have very strong cultural pressure, the third evolution is that they eat, we eat more animal origin products. Would they be fish? Would they be milk? Would they be meat? It depends on the cultural aspects sometimes. But they all increase the consumption of animal uh, products. And there, there is a, a graph. On the left, I put a few countries. And on the right, all the countries for which FAO has data. And you see that whatever the zone you come from, there is either a slight increase or a big increase but there is always an increase in animal product consumption. So in fact, what does it mean? It, it means a problem for agricultural production because to produce one calorie from animal, you need at least three calories on average when you take into account the more efficient systems, you know, the carp system in China, for instance. So you need more calories when you eat animal products than when you eat plant products. So of course it will need more agricultural production. And the second question is which kind of animal product you eat and the fact that for instance for beef the greenhouse gases efficiency let's say of the protein of the calorie from protein from beef is six times higher producer of greenhouse gases than for instance pork or chicken or egg. So that means that not only it depends on the quantity of animal origin products, but at the same time, you need to look at the mix of animal products people are eating. If you look at uh, the production, what we did before, and at the population, you see that the needs of the different zones of the world are all increasing, but in, at different rates. And of course, some of the zones increased a lot their agricultural production, maybe you remember that graph, and the others increased, but more slowly. And the population at the same time increased quite quickly, almost everywhere. And so, of course, that made uh, an obvious result, that is to say that more and more, there are, there are growing trade needs either surpluses, either deficits, but there is a growing need in trading food in the world. And when you look at the tendencies for tomorrow, it is the same situation. And the last element I wanted to show you about the food situation is about the price of the food. As I said at the beginning, access, economic access to the food is one of the bigger elements of food insecurity. And so, you know, volatility, economists will tell you, and they, well, they still tell it, that volatility is useful because it's a way to adapt production, well, supply and demand, if you want, to be short. That is to say, of course, there, there is a reaction of the producers when there is a lack of product, of products, and the prices are high, so they cultivate more. So it's a normal mechanism of adaptation. But since let's say 2007, we had new elements in the landscape that make volatility very different from what it was before. That is the normal phenomenon of adaptation. And the, the first element I could give you as an example is that when there was the subprime crisis in the state, well, in 2007, the wheat price increased by 10%. Why four? I mean, the link between the price of the wheat and uh, the subprime crisis is not obvious. And it was through financial investments, of course, because there is a commodity market people can invest on. And so there is a new phenomenon that makes volatility change far more quickly than it did before. So it's no more a supply-demand adaptation, but there are other elements on the top of the normal adaptation than the classical ones. So if I want to look at uh, today's challenges, in fact, there are several of them, and uh, you already 
heard about them yesterday, but the environment protection and the scarcity of, national, uh, of natural resource will be one, I will come back to. And of course, at the same time, you have the demand of non-food products, but you will have a speech tomorrow about that, so I won't be uh, very long about that. You have the overnutrition and obesity issue, that is a very important one, and you have the undernutrition issue. So, I will come in a few words to the natural resources under constraint. One is very famous, and especially in your country, you know very well about it. That is to say the very big importance of, of water scarcity in some zones of the world, and the increasing uh, water scarcity because of the climate change and because of the increase in the use of water. So, of course, it's one of the very important elements for agriculture. As you may know, that agriculture uh, takes 70% of the withdrawals of fresh water in the world. So it's uh, consumer number one of water. You have another natural resource maybe you talk less about, except maybe the specialist, that is the soil. So the soil, if you want, is a support first. Then it is a physical chemical matrix so that, well, plants can grow and things like that. And on the top of that, it is a living uh, matrix. Maybe you know that in one gram of soil, you have about one billion organisms. And if you had not this living matrix, you couldn't transform the, chemi well, the chemical compounds that are necessary for feeding the plants. So at the moment, we have a, a problem of consumption of this soil, both by physical degradations, by chemical contamination, and um, because of um, salinization, of course. So the problem will be how do we care about the soil, the quantity of soil, and the quality of soil. To give you uh, an order of magnitude, uh, to, re well, to recover one centimeter of soil, depending on the, on the rock, if you want, on the basis, it takes between 50 years and 1,000 years. So if you want to renew one centimeter. So it's a very slowly renewable um, background. And I talk very briefly about, about biodiversity and what I would like to say is that, in fact, uh, biodiversity decreased, and agriculture is one of the reasons of the decrease, because to be efficient, you know, the same breeds, the same varieties have been planted or, or have been uh, uh, bred uh, a lot. So you have more homogeneity than you had before. And of course, it makes a decrease in the biodiversity, natural biodiversity. So why is it important to look after it? Of course, we don't know the conditions, the, the agroecological conditions of our world tomorrow. And you understand that when you have a lot of diversity, you have a better resilience of the system. Because of course, some plants may be not adapted to the new conditions, but if you have a lot of varieties, then some of the plants may be adapted. So you understand that is, it is a very important factor in the context of change to have a big biodiversity. And on the top of that, you have a new phenomenon, but I won't be long on that one. It's the fact that we exchange, we have a lot of movements between the different zones of the world. Well, I'm a food, security, uh, food safety specialist personally. And in fact, uh, previously when we talked about the disease in the world, you had some big zones and that they were considered as independent. Now, and it, it was a very good work published in Nature a few years ago. When you have a microbe somewhere in the world, and it, as the example was about uh, the flu, uh, when it goes more than 100 kilometers in a circle of more than 100 kilometers, it's impossible to stop it. Because you have so much circulations of people with their shoes of goods that are exchanged that it is impossible to stop the dissemination of uh, the agent. 
And it means that more and more, you have invasive species in new zones. And either they adapt, either they don't, but it, this phenomenon increases at the same time. So it was a very short um, point about the natural resources constraints, but we should be careful about that so that the next generation can go on producing. So what, you know, in INRA and CIRAD, so I, I chaired INRA during eight years, and so we decided to start a foresight exercise to question the fact that it was possible to feed the world in 2050. Why 2050? Because demographic people tell you that probably it will be the plateau and then it will decrease. Of course, there is a lot of uncertainty about that. It depends on the evolution of the birth rate, especially in South Saharan Africa. But, well, if I put that, uh, I don't look at it anymore. Uh, 2050 is the, you know, the date people are looking at because it will be the most difficult one. That is, to, it should be 9 billion people. And so what we tried to do is to figure out some scenarios, very uh, con contrasted ones, to see which factors were leading factors so that we can feed the world or not. And what could be you know, the, the very important uh, topics we should work about. As research body, it's very important to look uh, uh, ahead. And so I described two, two, the two scenarios. One is a business as usual one. We took the Millennium Assessment, uh, MEA is the Millennium Environmental Assessment at world level. So we took that uh, scenario, that is to say business as usual, and we, you know, we go on with the trends that we can observe now. And we, we built what we call a normative scenario because you, you choose the parameters and you choose uh, the hypothesis. That is to say, if we had in all parts of the world 3,000 kilocalories per person per day, uh, let's say that for me, for instance, I need 2,200 kilocalories per day, Maybe somebody that is working, well, maybe a man working uh, physically more than I do would be more, you know, so of course a child would, would be less. But on average, let's say that uh, 2,200 or 2,300 is a good uh, consumption. So as you have some uh, losses that you cannot prevent, you don't eat all the potato, you don't eat all the banana and so on, so you have a loss to take into account. So with 3,000 kilocalories per person per day, you have enough on average. And so the, our hypothesis was that there were in all uh, regions of the world, the 3,000 kilocalories per person per, per day, uh, 500 of which coming from animal resources, either livestock, well, either egg, milk, uh, meat, or fish. And um, that's... Uh, we took into a, well, we take into account a sustainable way to produce uh, the feed that is necessary. And so, the, you know, that way, by having very different scenarios, you see what are the limiting factors. Of course, we don't know what will be uh, 2050, but you can see what are the big uh, drivers, what are the big limiting factors. So here I just put the fact that uh, the business as usual is t between... 2,500 in southern Africa, and between, well, 4,000 and 4,600 in OECD countries, and the other hypothesis is uh, 3,000 everywhere. So, of course, when you look at those scenarios, you have a lot of questions. In both scenarios, we, need, uh, we meet the quantity requirement, but South Saharan Africa uh, Middle East and North Africa and Asia are increasingly importers. So then what should we look at? So we should like look at trade security so you can import and export safely, if I may say so. You need to look at the prices so that there is a possibility of economic access to the food and to reduce the poverty so that people can have this economic access. If I look at the hypothesis that we want to feed the world in a sustainable way, then we have to look 
at at least the sustainable way to produce in agriculture and the sustainable way to have a food system. So we have to look at the diet and to look at the waste and losses. So if I go to the conclusion uh, of agreement immediately, in fact, we've seen that there were four limit, well, four very important actions to look at. First, to increase the production efficiently. So it, may, it means to invest, you know, to invest to have uh, plant protection, to invest to have good stocks, infrastructures, to invest to train the people, and more generally to, do, to, to switch to what we call sustainable intensification of agriculture. The second group of action is about food consumption behaviors. You've seen the two hypotheses of Agrimonde. And depending on the hypothesis on the diets, the requirement for the supply is very different. It's more than 30% of difference on the supply side, depending on the diets you are working on. Then you have to work on the food waste and losses to look at the trade regulation and the volatility issue that could be dealt at international level partially, and of course to be careful about uh, climate change. So, if I go quickly on the climate change, why is it so important? First, and I, I've seen that uh, Nina quoted it, in fact it has an effect on the yields. You've seen that in the past, the yields were always on a positive trend. Uh, in fact, uh, between 1980 and 1990, it's uh, it was slower, but we had an evolution of the yields. But since, well, let's say 1990s and 1990s, you see the, the figures, the exact figures uh, on the left, we have a plateau in the yields. There I give you the example of the wheat. And it is true in France, so we have done the study you see uh, on the half, the, the half uh, of the image. Then we have the figures for Europe, and then we have uh, figures for the world. And you see that it is a world phenomenon. The plateauing of the um, yields for wheat is a global phenomenon. And if I look to more cereals, more crop, then you see that it is true for maize, wheat, soya, and rice. So all, you know, when you look at uh, maize, wheat, rice, and soya, you have the main part of the food of the world. And you've seen that, uh, in fact, except Argentina for soya, because it's extensive, so you have a margin, ex except for that, it's always had a negative effect. Climate change has a negative effect on the yields. So, in fact, when you look at the situation, we see that food security is not, no more taken for granted by the objective situation. And in fact, there I figured the number of scientific articles. And it's amazing to see that before food security was not really an issue for scientific uh, uh, people. I mean, until let's say 2006 or seven, it was really low noise publication. Then it increased very steeply. And the availability question is uh, the question number one in those publications. And what's, maybe, maybe I should say that in a few words. Uh, there was a real change, let's say, between 2007 and 2008, uh, and you have several signs of it. First, the international organizations realized that what they did before was wrong. And it's always very slow to realize that and to have a consensus that says that they made a mistake. Because they thought that it was good to finance industry sector, but they stopped financing the rural sector. And then they realized that if they wanted to push the development of the developing countries, they needed first to finance the rural development through development of agriculture. So that was the change of direction of the international organizations, and the symbol of it is the report by the World Bank of 2008. And at the same time, you had the crisis in the price. You remember 2007, the bank investing in commodities, and 2008, uh, well, some climate problem, production problems, 
and the fact that the stocks all around the world were very low and this um, spike in the prices. So in fact, around 2008, and for different reasons, you had a real turn in the food security uh, uh, policies. And when you look at the different dimension of food security, so we have talked about food availability on a global level and on a local level, food access, would it be physical or economic? Food utilization, that is to say your food diet, whether you have waste or not, and stability in the food system, and especially uh, the price. I mean the price and the uh, differences between the seasons, let's say. So you have to have a permanent access to food. And all those dimensions are affected negatively by climate change. And so we should be very careful about climate change. So what is what I put there is a very interesting, from my point of view, um, question that was asked to the decision makers at world level in Davos in 2013. So they were asked, you know, in abscess, what is the likelihood of a risk and, um, and what it was the importance of the impact of the different risks that were listed. And when you look at the more likely and more risky events in the yellow circle, you get a lot of elements that we have talked about. Water supply crisis, uh, sec well, extreme volatility in energy and agricultural prices, food shortage crisis, global, uh, except for, well, if I sum summarize, except for several income disparity, except from uh, weapons, the biggest risk that are identified by the decision makers in Davos are all linked to the condition of sustainable food systems. So it's interesting to see at which speed the reality was understood by the decision makers. I mean the real, well, first the international organizations, then the food riots, then uh, in fact uh, uh, some expert reports about the global situation and the fact that uh, globally the world leaders understand that it, those are the priorities we should tackle. So which recommendation we could uh, make as people from the science, uh, scientific background to help that the route we take until 2050 is not a dramatic one but is a positive one. So first the climate change mitigation, as you, have seen, as you have seen, either for the yields of the plants, either for the wa water supply, uh, climate change is very important. And so maybe the first priority we should be careful about is that we try to mitigate climate change, well, in all sectors, but as agriculture is around, uh, well, let's say, a quarter of uh, climate change uh, gas emission, then we should work on that on agriculture as well. Why is agriculture so important? Because of agricultural practices on one side, and the animals especially, and on the other side because of the change of, what, of land use when you switch a forestry to uh, crop land, then you have less carbon stocking you put some carbon back in the atmosphere. So it's very important to mitigate climate change in general and to mitigate climate change from agricultural uh, practices. The second uh, element I would insist on, because it's a new element, you know, I've been in uh, that work, kind of work for many years, and in fact, we used to think that there were a cultivable land in excess in the world. Why for? Because the FAO figures were quite big and that we thought that a lot of lands could be cultivated. And then we realized a few years ago, it's quite recent, that in fact, in theory, you had some cultivable lands, if you want, 
But then in practice, you needed water, you needed access, you need climate that fit agriculture, and that, of course, the real surface that was cultivable on the top of what is cultivated today is not a lot. And in fact, it's not, a lot, it's not enough to make the increase in production that we need for the increase um, in the population and the increase in the economic power of the population. You always have to remember that not only the population is increasing, but the middle class is increasing. You know, it, the evaluation is 3 billion people in 2030. And those people ask for a, mod, a lot more food or consumption goods than when they are poor. It's obvious. But it, it makes the biggest difference. Not only the demography, but the fact that the middle class are increasing quite quickly. And so, in fact, the demand will increase with all those factors. And so we need to, to be very careful about the supply. And land, of course, is a, a very important factor for the supply. And so if I uh, stop a few minutes on that uh, slide, how can we, in fact, to secure 2015, we should be careful about climate change, then we should be careful not to increase the food demand too quickly, and for that we will see that afterwards we need to work on food diets and on wastes and losses, and we need to increase the production the food production at the same time, either from earth, either from aquaculture. So to increase the production in a sustainable way, what are the means? And then we have to go through all kind of research or investment in infrastructures or in, um, for instance, training, and means, technical means or socio-technical means to increase a sustainable production, what we call the uh, intensification of agriculture, the sustainable intensification of agriculture. And I, if I give you some examples, because as Yves said, just said, I just wrote a report for the French government on the, the routes that could be taken, the innovations that uh, could be used and, uh, you know, disseminated. Then we have, well, things that are already existing and practiced. And I will give you examples because there are quite a lot of examples. Of course, you have the future plant breeding, how you adapt better the plant. The capacity to evaluate and to improve the soil, the soil quality. To take on board farmers that are left behind, that is to say, when you look at the theoretical yield, usually some of, well, people don't reach the ideal yield, but some of them are really far away. So how could you help them to, to have a better yield? And then, to give you some examples, you know, I was in Colombia recently. Uh, of course, uh, the feeding by the grass, the animal, is not very efficient on average. But they found a new um, species, that is uh, Brachiaria. Well, it's not a new species. It, it has been in Africa for years and years, but it has been a lot improved by breeding. Then, with Brachiaria, they can put 10 times more animal in one hectare than before with a better production. So you imagine there are a lot of things like that, agroforestry, you have crops and trees at the same time. Uh, to what we say, uh, uh, to manage the manure, to have vegetable strips, uh, to have uh, uh, water, uh, what we call uh, uh, water use intensification, if you want, with special methods. And when you look at practical examples, you have very practical results in Botswana, in Zimbabwe, in Niger. If you are interested, there are really very high-scale practical examples of improvement of the production and the sustainability of the production. So we have already some techniques and some kind of organizations, because sometimes it's more the socio-economic organization that the techniques that matter, but both of them make it possible to improve a lot, to improve a lot, the efficiency of agriculture. You know, I have an example there that uh, the gross margin by hectare is multiplied by four to seven. It was in Zimbabwe by changing practices. So you have a margin of improvement. And at the same time, well, you need some new, well, some innovations and some research to improve the limiting factors, of course, water efficiency. 
is, uh, will be, is and will be a priority and, and so on. Nitrogen efficiency, how you can improve the soil composition uh, without consuming too much uh, chemical fertilizer that is a very big consumer of energy. So, well, just giving you uh, some examples to say that we can improve a lot uh, the methods of farming to improve the food production. Then talking about uh, the demand side, of course there is a diet, and I already quoted some figures that showed you the importance of the diet between uh, 3,000 calories per day or 4,600 calories per day as in North America, then you see that, of course, the difference in uh, the necessary uh, production is very big because it, the magnitude is very different. But you have another factor that is quite important, that is waste and losses. Waste and losses are happening in very different places depending on in which country we, uh, we are. Sometimes it's plant protection that should be increased. Sometimes it's a storage of the cereals, for instance, that should prevent rooting and things like that. And, but in uh, developed countries, usually it's the consumer that makes the more waste and losses. And all together globally at the world level, it's one third of the production that is wasted or lost at world level by weight, and one quarter, a quarter by calorie. So in, you imagine the order of magnitude is not a small one. So of course, it's a very important fact to, to make the demand uh, change. We have the animal consumption that is very important. We need to reduce, the, well, to moderate in our, well, in France or in in North America, in Europe, in OECD country, to moderate the meat consumption or to have a better mix of origin of the animal protein. It will, be, uh, it will make a big difference for the food demand. And of course, to improve the diets because a lot of people eat in excess at the moment. And it, it's not the most important fact because when we have looked at that, it's only minus 6% of the demand that would uh, be there if uh, we fight against obesity. But in fact, it's a very important element, not because of the supply problem, but because of the health problem. You know that at the moment I quote it like that, but uh, it's very new in the world. There, are m there is more morbidity and mortality in the world now from non-infectious diseases, that is to say nutrition diseases or things like that, more morbidity and mortality than from infectious disease. It's a very new phenomenon. I mean, the, the tendency in the world is completely uh, changed. And diet composition, as I told you, is a very big driver of the health status. And that's the main reason why we should moderate uh, the increase in uh, the consumption in some parts of the populations. In fact, you know that it is no more a Nordic or it's no more uh, OECD problem, it's a world problem, because in every country and every village sometimes you have cohabitation of uh, several differences in uh, the diets. So if I want to summarize, um, and I've been a little uh, long maybe, uh, feeding 9 billion people is possible, is possible, if, and it's as when you read the science fiction book, you know, you need to, to see what are the possible factors so that you can influence. I don't know whether you, you've read, well, some of them, where they, can, where they try to influence the path that humanity takes by trying to figure out what are the possible uh, factors. And so we, we know that we should innovate and invest in agriculture. That's for the supply side of it. And um, that's what we call uh, sustainable intensification. We should secure trade, and it's not a neutral uh, sentence to say that, because WTO discussed about, about, about preventing uh, importing barriers all the past years, but they never discussed about how to prevent exporting barriers. And maybe the, the one of you that are very uh, sensible to the topic know that you know, when there was a food crisis, 
when there was a rise price increase, some countries decided to shut the border so that the price in the country doesn't increase too much. And then the effect at world level was immediate. The sharp increase in the price at world level. So in fact, WTO should not only look at import disciplines, but should look at export disciplines. And that's quite new. And should look, and should look maybe if some international organizations should look at the stocks because one of the reasons of the volatility is that you have no more possibility to, to put on the market suddenly your stocks if there is an increase in the prices. Decrease in waste and losses, so we have talked about that. Moderate the change in the diet composition because of this transition in uh, nutritional transition that is very quick, as I told you, and the divergence between the genetic evolution and the nutrition evolution. Mitigation of climate change for me is uh, priority number one. And then, of course, the management of natural resources so that there is a long-term sustainability of the food system. So innovation, training, I mean, it's all about what university and research centers are doing. So I hope that uh, by being in KAUST, you are quite now conscious that you are one actor of the system. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, my question is regarding that one slide that you had with the increasing costs of the different um, cereals and sugar and milk and so on. And um, I saw that the meat curve is pretty um, constant, actually. So meat prices don't seem to fluctuate very much. So why is it that way? And is that somehow artificially achieved or something? No, well, you've been quite uh, careful about, yes, the curve, and you are right. In fact, you have what we call commodity futures. You know, you have a future in Chicago, a future, uh, I mean, financial markets from some, for some commodities. And in fact, some uh, people decided to invest in those uh, futures, and that made the, you know, that amplified, that didn't cause, but that amplified the variations of the prices, the natural physical variation of the prices because of sometimes, you know, a draft in Australia that made a difference in the wheat or the cereal production in the world, sometimes, you know, a physical element, a physical accident. And then that amplified the physical uh, uh, shortage, let's say. Hello, hi. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it has been a nice presentation. And I actually like to know if there is a really a uh, will from the world leaders, the decision makers, as you mentioned, those who meet in Davos, for example, to eliminate this uh, food insecurity. Because uh, from history and from what's really going on now, we are not even able to feed the 7 billion that we are right now. And especially, I'm um, referring to, like you mentioned repeatedly on your slides, especially in Africa. And you also mentioned that uh, the food insecurity in Africa is really related very much to economic reasons. And also, I think everyone is almost aware, the economical reasons of Africa is also by manipulated by some other factors. And also in Africa, especially, because from the developed countries, they put this some sort of uh, subsidies that actually not really favorable to the food growers and uh, workers in Africa. So they basically trying to drive out of business, that's one. And uh, without uh, uh, delaying much here. So uh, also the good, I'm really happy because you also work for the French government. 
and also especially uh, the African countries that are French colonies are not really doing well. So could you please elaborate and uh, help us if we can really, you know, uh, like feed uh, these people? Because I'm not really, I don't believe that actually, you know, African people are hungry. That's for that one too, for sure. But there are some other reasons. So like, yeah. can you really elaborate on this? Thank you. Yeah. So yes. Uh, so the places where people are undernourished are, ma are mainly Asia and Africa. But uh, the situation is improving more quickly on average, of course, because Africa is not only one zone. You have to look at each zone specially. I mean, some are doing very well and or doing better, and some are in a very bad condition. Uh, so the first cause of undernourishment, as I told quickly, is crisis, war, you know, physical difficulty for access. And that is another field, I mean, we are not, well, we cannot, as researchers in uh, food sciences or <laughs> agricultural sciences or, or environment, work on that. I mean, it's a, mo a broader issue, a very important one, because it's a first cause. You know that the majority of people that are undernourished are farmers. 50% of the people that are undernourished in the world are farmers. And 25% extra are uh, people without land. I mean, people in the rural uh, part of the countries, but without land. So in fact, that's why when, you know, in 2008, I told you that the international organization realized that what they did, what, the, what they had done for more than 30 years was a mistake. Because the first action you can take, except peace, but that's not the same kind of issue, except peace. What the, the best solution to take people out of undernourishment is to develop agriculture. Because agriculture, again, will give money to rural places, and that's the place where more people are undernourished. In fact, the 2008 riots were urban riots. So it's very interesting for people from my context to see that. You know, people have been angry for years and years but you didn't hear about them. When there were urban people being hungry, you hear them because the journalists go to cities. They don't go a lot to countryside. And so, well, that was more noisy, if you want, when people in the cities could not buy the food because of the price hike. So the first solution, if we talk about solution, is improving agriculture context. So that means what? That means, well, factors of production. That means infrastructures, because you need roads to go to markets. That means to have markets. That means storage, because as I showed you, most of the waste in uh, African countries, for instance, is because of uh, parasites of the crops or be uh, because of bad storage. So you need to invest. You know, we have examples of very successful um, small operations that made a very big difference, you know, to build, to, to build locally uh, some silos or things like that, metallic silos that prevented from rooting, you say that? Moisture? Yes, yeah, so you, you understand what I mean. Because, of course, aflatoxin, well, you know all what happens when you have a bad conservation of uh, the cereals, for instance, or arachid or things like that. So, you know, the first way to, to solve the problem or to improve the situation is investment. And I have to say, because uh, it's really proved now, that uh, investment in women empowerment is one of the best solutions. Because the women, by tradition, give in priority the, you know, what they get to the children. So, well, you are, now we know you know, a list of actions that are the more efficient uh, to improve the situation. So maybe if you are interested, we, we can talk about that more. But I think that no, more or less now there is a consensus that we should invest, we should innovate, train, um, build infrastructures, um, be careful that the women benefit from the organization and the training. You know, a list of actions that are quite efficient. 
My question, uh, thanks for an excellent talk. My question to you is, uh, we listened to a very excellent uh, talk yesterday by genetically modified foods. Uh, as a person working in the health sector, you know, I personally have seen the benefits of vaccines, which are also medically, uh, genetically modified, like for hepatitis B vaccine, uh, which I'm immunized and probably will protect me from hepatitis B. You failed to mention genetically modified foods in the production of, uh, f to meet these goals by 2050. Uh, what are your thoughts about genetically modified foods? Okay, so I mentioned breeding, plant breeding in general. So genetically modified foods are, I mean, GM plants are improved plants by a special technique, that is to say to introduce, well, genes from another, well, another plant or another something else. So, of course, it's one of the breeding improvement I was quoting. So I didn't mention GM specifically, as you have many methods to improve the plants, to improve the genetics of the plants. So in fact, you know that for GM, the situation of the societies are very different around the world. Uh, in fact, um, when, when you do research, when you are in your labs, doing GM research is just a question of complying with the regulation of your country. And I mean, it's a researcher-researcher uh, problem. And it's, uh, you know, maybe around the world, in all countries, you have GM research. But when you talk about innovation and you talk about putting on the market an innovation, of course, it becomes a social question. I mean, it's no more just a question of innovating and researching. It's a question of putting on the market such and such an innovation. And of course there, you have very different reaction of the societies. And I would say that unfortunately, because, well, it's a long story to tell about it. Well, but uh, in, um, for instance, in my country, but in Europe in general, in Australia, well, in some zones of the world, uh, for food products, there is a kind of reluctancy to oppositions depending on which country you are talking about at the moment on certain uh, GM constructions, not the vaccines, because in France we have used the uh, vaccines against ra animal rabies that was genetically, well, that used genetically modification. So it's not against everything, but it's against a food that comes from that technique. Of course, as a scientist, I would say we shouldn't react like that. It should be a case-by-case -case basis. We should look at the risk and benefits of the construction. But, you know, the so society's reactions are not always really driven by uh, scientific uh, approaches. So I quoted globally plant breeding, but afterwards the GM situation is very different, well, depending on which country you are working in. Um, Marion, it was very nice to have an injection of economic and um, those social analyses. But um, I was wondering if you've got any comments about the role of, the potential role of trade subsidies and farming subsidies, you know, in EU, US, Japan, and how that might alter world food production. And distort some of those otherwise rational or semi-rational economic forces. And can I ask a second question? Um, you emphasise climate change as being extremely important as a challenge for future global food production. I'm just wondering what the mechanisms you see are in the effect of, negative effect of global climate change on food production. And I ask this because most of our crops are, have been selected over the last 10,000 years to be very generalist and very broad and highly flexible and adaptive so we can grow wheat from the tropics to the Arctic. And so for me, I feel like the breeding companies and the breeders in the public sector will be responding over those gradual uh, effects of climate change, at least at the genetic side. But maybe you can comment on the other aspects of impacts of global climate change. Okay, so very important questions. So the first one about the subsidies, you know, since, uh, well, the last agreement about which kind of subsidies are accepted at world level so that they don't, um, handicap too much uh, the trade. 
uh, you have what we call, you know, the green, the orange box. I don't know whether you are, you are interested by those kind of details. And so globally, the agricultural subsidies now are less uh, influential on trade than they were when it was related to production. You know, it's a different mechanism, not, not linked to the output of the field. And uh, so it's what we call decoupled, more or less. I mean, it's always coupled in a way through the income of the farmer, of course, but it's more or less decoupled. And so there is a good literature about that, uh, scientific literature about the effect of the subsidies on the exchanges, and it's a minor effect. I mean, to answer this question of, of our colleague from Africa, or that was interested uh, in Africa, um, in fact, the effect is minor. Um, so if you want, I could send you articles. I mean, there are economists working on that. But it is because, uh, in fact, uh, the kind of subsidies that are used have been changed. Uh, then your second question, of course, is a very good one. When you look at the article that was uh, written by Nadine Brisson on wheat, you know, they used 2,000 uh, trials, 2,000 uh, uh, practical experiments, and looked at all the factors that could explain, you know, that, diff that plateau, that new evolution of the yields, as you know, from uh, just after the Second World War, of course, the yields increased dramatically because of fertilizers, phytosanitary products, and things like that. And obviously, you know, it, it, when you compare to the historic tendency, it's really amazing to see the, the rate of increase we got at that time. And then the plateau. And so they tried to understand whether it was an economic reason, because of course the farmers in France said, you know, we had the CAP, so we were uh, for, well, we were prevented from putting too much uh, fertilizers. We were prevented, well, we had some bad prices. You know, farmers always uh, think that the, the grass is greener elsewhere. And so, they, well, and so they have looked at all the factors that could explain that. And of course, there have been a slight decrease in um, nitrogen use in fertilizers, but Obviously, the reason after the analysis is really climate change. And of course, what you say is completely right. That is to say, how do you adapt uh, to the new conditions? And is it possible not only to adapt uh, the genetic um, selection, but to adapt the economic conditions? Because we know now that pheno well, the, the phenotype you, you show depends not only on the genetic context, but on what I call, you know, the environmental context, that is to say, how you cultivate, uh, at which date, whether you, well, you have a lot of factors that explain, well, the real yield of the crops. And, of course, the problem is now, uh, for instance, if I look at wheat in uh, um, the center of France, where it is very productive, is that sometimes you have three days of drought when you shouldn't because biologically the wheat needs at that moment you know, to be fed. And you have, the problem is that it changes a lot. It is the variability of the conditions. So of course you will maybe, once answer to your question, is resilience of the yield to changes in drought, changes in heat. But sometimes the biology is more rigid than that, as you know well. That is to say, sometimes in a very sensitive period, you need some conditions. And if you don't have them, then it is a problem. So you are right that uh, genetic improvement could uh, increase the resilience of the varieties that uh, are cultivated to climate change. But you will need to adapt more than genetics. Thank you. Thank you for the present. I'm here. Hi. Yes. Um, thank you for the uh, great presentation. Um, I have a question about the slide you presented in, in quite the beginning of your talk regarding the increase in crop yields. And I would like to ask if you can quantify how much of that, what I would call a phenomenal growth in yields, can be attributed to increase in, in oil usage or, or usage of other non-renewable resources and whether that same increase can be seen in 
in well, if you measure the same phenomenon not in calories but in in vitamins or minerals or other oh. nutrients that you you would wish to get from your food thank you Yes, that's a very good question, but a very difficult one. So you've seen that here, as I talk globally, we only looked at the quantity of calories. But of course, not all the calories are equivalent, and you need micronutrients, as you said. I mean, you need some special, uh, at special time of your life, you need some special, in very low concentration, but you do need some elements that are really compulsory, if I may say so, for for a good health or a good growth. So, of course, um, if I talk about deficiency, common deficiency, you have the vitamin A deficiency, you have the folate deficiency, you have the iron deficiency. And, in fact, you should, like, uh, you should look at the diet. On the top of what I'm quoting at the moment, you should look at the diet. But as it is very diverse, it's very difficult to give you a global scope of the micronutrients deficiencies. So we know globally which are the most important ones. We, we know at which time of the life they are more important. But in fact, we sh you should look at all the diets, especially to see whether it's uh, satisfied or not. I mean, it's, uh, it's more, um, I, I would need a more detailed presentation than the one I gave today. But you are right, yes. Uh, when, I, when we talk about uh, malnutrition, malnutrition is altogether undernourishment, deficiencies, and overnourishment. Uh, thank you. Um, you restricted your presentation until the last moment very effectively to calories. Only in your last comment you mentioned in passing that there is a far more important problem in the moment than hunger or lack of calories. It is common knowledge that hidden hunger is a far more pressing problem than hunger because the consequences of hidden hunger are irreversible. Most of the consequences of hunger are reversible. So was there a specific reason that you restricted your presentation on calories and ignored uh, the problem of hidden hunger? Well, unfortunately, uh, hunger when you are less than five years old is not reversible what we call stunting children. They have consequences all their life long. So it's not, you know, when you are an adult, it could be different. But when, you're, when you are a child, you have many irreversible effects. So that's why we are very careful altogether. I mean, all the specialists of the food systems are very careful about uh, uh, the diets of the children. If I may uh, continue, you are aware of the problem of hidden hunger. I don't understand. Which hunger? You are aware of the problem of hidden hunger. Hunger affects uh, ah, yes. less than one billion people. Hidden hunger is a severe problem for three billion people. Yeah. And the Copenhagen consensus, the think tank of economists says, in its recent recommendations, put um, interventions against hidden hunger on top of the list of interventions. So we should not uh, overlook that by being used to consider lack of calories a severe problem, that we are overlooking a far more important problem, which is the lack in micronutrients. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's what I was asking what was the reason to restrict your presentation so tightly to the problems of calories and uh, not mention anything about the far more important problem of lack of micronutrients? This was my question. Well, is it more important? I don't know. But uh, in fact, my topic was, uh, is it, uh, as I said, um, food security 
is about availability of the quantity, is about access, physical access and economic access, is about uh, the food diets, I don't know, uh, that was my third item, and then about uh, variability, excessive variability. That is to say how you have access during the time and with the problem of um, the prices. So yes, you're right, it's a very important problem. Micronutrients, deficiencies and things like that are very important. There, I was looking at the global balances between supply and demand at world level and what were the big problems so that we have a sustainable uh, food system. So of course, I agree with you that uh, in my book, if you want, there is a chapter about food diets. But here, I do not have time to come back to that. But you are right, it's a very important problem. I already recognize that, yes. I agree with you on that part. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I wanted to ask you about um, land being uh, distributed uh, sort of more equitably among uh, farmers because you have in some third world countries, especially in my country, you have this problem that uh, some farmers are, well, they're not farmers, they're actually very powerful people and they own very large amounts of land and they have considerable influence in the government as well. And what they do is, uh, since they have so much land and they can, you know, they have the capacity to feed the country, but the problem is because they will earn more in exports, so they prefer to export the, their produce rather than feed the, their own country. So how do you, I mean, okay, we can create more than enough food for ourselves, but if it's all going somewhere else, right, if it's not going to the right people, how do you solve this problem of uh, this, uh, you know, feeding people who actually need it, who are, you know, suffering from this food shortage uh, within certain communities. How do you tackle this problem? Well, again, we come back to agricultural investment. When I, I told you what are the priority, well, what is the priority list of actions so that you tackle um, undernourishment and globally poverty, rural and uh, farmers' poverty? Uh, the first action is to uh, invest in agriculture, you know, seeds, fertilizers. You know, sometimes uh, the yields are so low that it is quite easy to, in, well, to increase the yields. Then to have market access possible, so roads to organize markets, to make it possible for the women uh, to, to sell a part if there is a market to get money so that they can buy the, uh, well, the basis of uh, the necessity. So yes, you have a list of actions to, in fact, those actions are mainly targeted to what we call family farmers. Well, family farmers, we should explain what it is. I mean, it's uh, mainly, it remains, it uh, relies on uh, the family workforce. And so, you know, priority actions when you want to fight uh, undernourishment are targeted towards those kind of people. Of course, you know, for the, we, we cannot be against big farms producing export goods, but the targeted, the priority actions are targeted to develop, uh, uh, the, well, the 50% of farmers that are hungry and the 25% of uh, people that live in rural areas without land. You would be, we would be. I'm not in charge. <laughs> I mean, obviously, I feel in charge as a scientist uh, of um, trying to figure out what are the tendencies, what are the limits, you know, to identify 
uh, the different routes that can be decided or that can be taken or the research priority, we should start today to be ready tomorrow. Of that, I feel in charge and I hope you do as well. But um, I think, you know, all people are actors in that battle because if you are a consumer and you waste 30% of what you buy, what is the average in France or Great Britain, I don't know what it is here, well, you are an actor of uh, the non-sustainability of the system. If you are a citizen, well, then you have uh, a vote to interfere. If you are a polit uh, well, uh, decision makers at political level, then you should organize the discipline so that export barriers don't come immediately or how to organize stocks. I mean, what I wanted in, you mean, in our conclusions, we wanted to be very clear about that. Of course, the normal citizen as a small action possible, but he can choose his diet or her diet. He can choose the losses aspect, you know. So every people is uh, involved. So I don't like your you. <laughs> you are involved as well. <laughs> Alors, I, am I uh, positive on the solution? Yes, am I, because I, I am, because, you know, but it's not rational afterwards. You know, you are a scientist, but afterwards you are a person. And are you positive-minded or are you um, negative-minded? I mean, really, my reaction is always to react, is always to see what possibility we have. So I try to open possibility. And so I think, you know, science especially, I'm sure that the biological science, ecological sciences, socioeconomic sciences are moving so quickly that a part of the solution will be in doing good science. On climate change, I will give you my personal feeling. It's not, uh, not, nothing more than that. Nothing more than, a, you know. It's that um, civil actors will be more efficient than government. Because you realize that initiatives are taken in every part of the world. You look at the American official position, it's very difficult. You look at uh, industry decisions, Sometimes they are quicker. It's the same in my country. So I hope that if people are conscious, you know, the actors, the industry, the, well, we'll make decision. We'll make decision before we have a government agreement. And maybe, well, it's very difficult, you know, those discussions with so many governments at world level, with constraints. How do you put constraints on a country? I mean, so, we need to have the discussions at global level, of course, because it will improve, I hope, a little the situation. But I think we should talk and make people conscious of the situation in all the places where we are. So that's a personal feeling. 